some basic stuff again one more time before class starts. Uh, just a reminder, you guys have something to do at two o'clock. So if you didn't do it, um, you're probably gonna have to email me and let me know about it. All right. Uh, that was in H chapter one. Yes, that is what is due in one minute. All right. The quizzes, the watch and consider, and the wrap it up quiz. And Actually, it it shows for me that it was due like a few hours ago at eleven a.m. It shows that on uh, it shows it on um, Canvas, and I will fix it. But on Cengage, on Cengage, it shows that it's due at two. Okay, so I'll fix that. It's just that I have another class at eleven, and I put that row of just remind, and all those are our reminder assignments, so that you see them in your calendar. Okay, but you still, you can't like click on them and go to it. You have to go through Cengage to get to it. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but first, I think we need to watch a little Schoolhouse Rock. My favorite song. In 1787, I'm told our founding fathers did agree to write a list of principles for keeping people free. The USA was just starting out a whole brand new country, and so our people spelled it out the things that we should be. They put those principles down on paper and called it the Constitution. And it's been helping us run our country ever since then. The first part of the Constitution is called the Preamble and tells what those founding fathers set out to do. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare at hand, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. you guys have learned quite a lot from that um, or maybe seen it in the past which is fantastic um, whenever speaking of things like later on we're going to talk about policies uh, one of the policies that used to be in place in the United States is that there had to be a certain amount of educational ed, uh, television on stations because the airwaves were owned by the people and so there had to be a certain amount of educational television. And so you see a lot of the Schoolhouse Rock or you see things like that as commercials. 
back in the 70s and 80s, whenever I grew up. Okay. Um, so um, let's see here really quickly. I want to share a couple, another screen with you before we get to the lecture today. <clears throat> So this is your Canvas page. Looks familiar, right? Now, some of it you won't see Edward's um, announcements. That's because you're not in his class specifically. And if you'll notice, if you are in Edward's class, it might be a point where you cannot see the Zoom link, right? So remember that announcements are always in announcements. So you can go down. And I'll delete some of these out so that it comes back up, but it's right there. Under uh, modules, I just want to remind you the Cengage text and exercises is here, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But this is week two, so Federalist 10 and 51, and a summary and analysis to help you out. Patrick Henry and Federalist 1, the U.S. Constitution, which you absolutely have to read, including the amendments by Friday, okay? And the chapter two and three workbook, which are due in your lab or however your lab instructor asks for them to be given to to them okay so it can be up on canvas it might be in person one of those two um, are due on friday and then we have today's lecture and we also have questions and so just a reminder we went through this last time but just a reminder these are the questions for today explain the framers philosophical views on People and government. How does Madison argue that separation of powers on large republic deals with individuals' tendency towards self interest? How does it combat the evil of faction? Um, how did the framers and Federalists and Anti Federalists differ in regard to individual rights? And give an example of how a Federalist and Anti Federalist debate is still a part of American political life. I want you to think about that while we're talking today during the lecture. And I, for me, if I was doing this digitally, I might you know, download this and pop it up over here and type on it while I'm lecturing. I might print it out or I might just write down, hey, to this one, I would keep these notes. Depends on what kind of note taker you are, but this is to direct your notes. And as a reminder, it's also something that is gonna be on your exam, either as a short answer or as a multiple choice question or can be potentially, okay? All right. Um, uh, just a reminder also, I have office hours directly after this class on Mondays. If you go to discussions, um, there is something here about, um, there's some stuff that hopefully is not published and you are not seeing, but um, I have my, gosh, where is it? There we go. Uh, Dr. Rowlett office hours Monday at 3 p.m., right? So you should be able to see that and that should work. I need to go clean that out so that I don't see these other things as well. But you also have an extra credit for a midterm one available. All right, so let's talk about um, the Constitution. Oh, just quick thing, I changed the times on the uh, reminders for Cengage assignments on Canvas. So that's been fixed. Thanks, Eric. Uh, the good news is, is if you had a reminder at 11 o'clock and it panicked you, then maybe you went in and were still able to do it, right? So um, hopefully that worked. Okay. All right. So the Constitution. Um, whenever I ask you this question in class uh, on Wednesday, which is most important to a democratic republic. Again, that's most important. I would argue that all these things are important. 42% um, of you said freedoms of belief, speech, press, association, and access to government. 34% of you said equality of persons in law and in fact. 19% said rule of law. And 5% said well-educated and participatory electorate. All these things are important, but you guys are putting a lot of emphasis on things like freedom. And this is kind of where we see the Constitution grow out of. During the time of revolution, during the formation of the United States at the very beginning in terms of its political structure, we were really focused on freedom and liberty and states' ability to self-govern. But it started causing some problems. One of the problems that it caused was that there was no real rule of law. Like whenever it came to Virginia ruling on something and South Carolina ruling a different way, that was that, right? 
Um, there's no way to enforce that. We also had some, had some problems with money. Um, there was a lot of a rapid deflation, which led to rebellions. Shay's Rebellion being the most uh, well known of those rebellions. And it all came down to the fact that they wanted the government to issue paper money, but there was no controlling government. It was South Carolina money or Pennsylvania money or New York money. And so there was nothing in control. And so there was no real, real way to regulate that. When we talk about the framers' philosophical views, probably the place where we can look to look at these philosophical views most clearly is James Madison. So you read Federalist 10 and 51. And Madison's gonna say, people are self-interested and government should check and contain that self-interest, that ambition. So let's, let's talk about self-interest. What is self-interest? You guys tell me, what's self-interest? What are some things that make my self-interest different than your self-interest? Um, can I say more? Sure, go ahead. Uh, so like, cause I'm a student, I might care more about like tuition costs. Sure, okay. So you're a student, so you care more about tuition prices. Uh, Seth says your personal gain, okay. Um, self-interest could be also, oftentimes it's interpreted as selfishness right, or self-centeredness. Um, but I think that Madison, while he certainly didn't say this is a great facet of human nature, he was a little more mm, neutral about it. So self-interest meant, hey, look, because of my position in life, these are my self-interests. Because of my background, because of where I live, these are my self-interests. So for example, I am an old woman. So my self-interests are different than yours. You are not old women, right? Some of you may be young women. And so as women, maybe we have some kind of similar perspectives. Some of you may have old souls and therefore can kind of see where I'm coming from or have parents or grandparents that you're very close to so you see their self-interest. One of the things that's important about self-interest is the framers are gonna say self-interest is something that is in each of us, but it's not necessarily um, something that is bad. Self-interest, ambition, right? Means we also do that thing that Jefferson was talking about. Remember happiness in the Declaration of Independence, being all you can be. Without my self-interest, then I would not be able to be all that I could be. It's necessary. But if it's unchecked, then people get hurt, people get marginalized. And so there has to be containment on that. This is a very important part of what the constitution was meant to do. That doesn't sound a lot like freedom, right? Sounds much more like restriction. Government is checking and containing that self-interest for the benefit of all. So that my ambition, maybe the best that I can be is channeled a little bit so that I don't harm others. Madison points out that the distribution of wealth is the cause of political conflict. Now remember, he does this about 100 years before um, Karl Marx says the same thing. For Madison, his position is a little bit different. He says, hey, look, factions are going to arise out of unequal distribution, but factions are going to arise out of lots of things. So. Um, the most dangerous faction he sees is the majority, those with little property. And so he's going to say, we have to protect the property of those who have it. You guys may say, well, I don't have a lot of property. I don't know that that's a good idea. I want some of that. But you do have a lot of property. And let me talk to you about what property you have. Because Madison is not just talking about land and stocks and, uh, you know, how much GameStop you currently own right? Instead, he's talking about things like your potential, your ability to work, your talent, your ideas, and land in your car and this fabulous coffee mug, right? He's talking about all of those things. And he says, so this protection of 
property is also protecting people's intellectual property. So one of the things that we know about the US Constitution is that it is the strongest in the world whenever it comes to what? Copyright protection. The United States is very strong on copyright protection because of this idea of protecting property. Protect the minority and the minority's property from the tyranny of the majority. What does that mean, tyranny of the majority? What do you guys think? What's a tyranny of the majority? Um, I, feel I think like it kind of goes. Uh, Gwen, you, you go, go ahead. Um, I just think it would mean that, like, the tyranny of the majority being like the majority wanting more than they already have, and like the minority is already the smaller group in this instant, and they probably don't own as much as the majority. So, trying to protect the minority so that they feel like they belong in this country, well, not like belong in this society and belong like here so that they're not being oppressed I guess I I don't think I said that the way that I was thinking it but um that's kind of like how I got it all right what else so when we're thinking about it from what you said previously where the majority was people who don't have a lot of property and the minority is people who do have a lot of property the majority ultimately has more power because you know strength in numbers so trying to make sure that the majority's needs are met but also the major the minority's needs are met and it's easy to just meet the majority's needs because there are so many so many more of them so that's kind of the majority's tyranny is taking over the needs that need to be met and taking away the needs that need to be met from the minority so okay and, and part of that too is when we're talking about this and and, and you know understand that madison you know he's kind of with the one percent okay he's saying hey look they earned that money well, things were a little bit different the one percent may not have earned that money necessarily in the way that they did in Madison's time, right? Um, but he wants to protect the ability of people to earn and to keep what they earned, all right? But at the same time, so, so not letting that just being taken away from them by the majority, right? But the majority as a whole, that tyranny of the majority goes to also Gwen's point, right? Which, so it's both of those things. And this idea that, you know, just because, you know, we have the most, if it's 51% to 49%, doesn't mean that the 49% don't have a say, right? So Kylie, you're absolutely right. And Gwen, we're also looking at it kind of from a broader perspective of that tyranny, right? So a balance from being seized by one faction, let's talk about factions for just a second. One of the things that Madison points out is he says, hey, look, a diverse nation, a nation that is made up of lots of different people, and it's big, the fact that it's spread all over the place, okay, means that our factions are also going to be split up, and that is going to help us keep a, a one faction from taking over. So whether that be the 1% or whether that be the 80%. Brian, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Um, so you said that um, he was trying to protect people making money and then keeping that money. So when does it get to the point where someone makes so much money that they don't have a say anymore because they're part of the 1%? Well, and again, you know, I think that that's something, you know, I don't think that's something that Madison contemplated quite as fully uh, in terms of the division of labor. Remember that in 1787, we're talking about a country where if people go out and, well, let's not, let's, let's be fair here. If a white male over age 25 is, or 18 even, but a white male is ambitious and uses his brain and, you know, works hard, then he's going to do okay. Okay. And he's going to be able to collect that and take care of his family and all those sorts of things. And that idea 
right, is that that should be protected. Okay, if we're going to expand that and say all people can do that, which I think is what is contemplated, but certainly not reality in 1787. Okay, Abigail Adams was certainly a thinker and a mover during this time, but she didn't have the political power of her husband, John. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about this, when we talk about that property, we're talking about everybody's ability to do that. Now today, we have kind of a different world. Um, for one thing, um, a lot of estate taxes, which were a, a part and parcel of um, English common law and were expected to continue, and they're not even talked about here because they're expected to continue, is gonna be some redistribution of that wealth. The idea that you don't necessarily get everything that your dad had, but if you, what you do get, if you work hard, you can keep it, right? But there's this possibility of it going away. So it's kind of a different world in terms of um, what possibility is. But Madison is concerned about this idea that people who have property, um, it will be taken away from them by those who have might, right? Because there's so many of them. And so with his idea with faction checking, faction power checking power, he's talking about the fact that maybe we're in different factions. So for example, Eric and I, I think come from similar backgrounds, but not the same background, agree. right? Okay. Um, and as a result, we kind of align ourselves differently, right? We identify ourselves as part of this group or that group. Would you say that's true, Eric? Yeah, I'm a Rotarian and you're a... Uh, elk. I'm an, an elk. elk. An elk, I forgot. Right. Yeah, but I mean, even ideologically and just the way we perceive certain things we think just differently. And that's just our upbringing and where we came from. Absolutely. And some of that might have to do with religion, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the way that we were raised, some of it may have to do with, you know, just kind of our life experiences. Some of it may be the paths that we've taken. So even though Eric is a PhD in the political science department, right? And yeah. I have a PhD in political science. We have those things that are similar but we have other things that are going to keep us from being of a single mind, right? And so Madison is saying, because we're going to be a big country, because there are going to be so many diverse interests, because we're going to expand in different ways, because states are going to have powers and different localities are going to have powers, and there are going to be farmers as well as merchants, as well as, you know, political science professors, then the factions are going to check each other until our cool and deliberative sense is gonna prevail. Um, so definitely, definitely. Um, oh, somebody asked what a Rotarian and an elk is. Oh, <laughs> well, we'll talk about that when we get to um, uh, the big sort and uh, when we talk about participation. But in sum, the Elks Club is a membership organ, large membership organization. Uh, it has local and also um, state and national groups. And it's more of a social club than anything else for professionals and for the whole community as a whole, actually. And a Rotarian. It's pretty much the same thing. It's a civic organization, but it's geared more towards the business community mm -hmm. in that sense. So. And so there are plenty of Rotarians who are also Elks, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but um, Rotarian is uh, Elks are more um, more kind of focused on a social, but also a, um, a giving focus. But the Rotarians do too; they do it as well. All right. So somebody asked what intemperate was. I'm ignoring the stock ch chatter over here. But someone asked what intemperate means. Intemperate means this. It means rash, passionate. It means acting in a way that is um, unwise, that's intemperate, okay? To have temperance is to have restraint, okay? So um, they're, they're definitely much more pessimistic on human nature, the Federalists are. 
um, more Abigail, less John, frankly, Adams. Um, they're protective of property rights and the constitution is too. And they're fearful of unwise majorities inflamed by demagogues. So you guys wanna know what intemperate means. Tell me what a demagogue is. Nobody's gonna tell me what a demagogue is. No, that's a demagogue. Really. Isn't that from Stranger Things? That's a demagogue. Okay. What's a demagogue? Luke, were you gonna tell me? Is it is it a widely held idea? No. Um, is Hercules is also a demigod. Ah, politician who uses fear as a tactic. Who did that one? There we go. Brownie boys. Was, okay. Um, use a popular favorite in order to gain power, but fear tactics, Allison. All right, you guys are on it, right? So a politician who uses emotion, particularly fear, to bring people to them and to raise up passions rather than they inflame popular sentiment. Absolutely. They get people to be passionate, right? And to act in a way that is against the best interests of everyone as a whole. Um, the media is not a demagogue. A demagogue is a particular person, right? So a demagogue. Um, Andrew Jackson, demagogue, actually, absolutely, okay? Hitler, demagogue, okay? Um, but not every politician, no. That is absolutely not true, okay? Um, so um, most politicians are not demagogues. Most politicians do not use fear to inflame majorities. Um, it's something that is to be feared and something that Madison was very concerned about. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the electoral college, okay, um, when we talk about the electoral college, we'll talk about why it was created and it was to keep demagogues from getting power. They were supposed to be able to make decisions at the time. So creating checks and balances. There has to be a separation of power. Uh, there is a separation of power. Um, this is part of the Constitution. It's going to limit, it's going to limit the power of the federal government, the legislative, executive, judicial. There's some things that each one of them can do and none of them, and the other one can't. There's some things that two of them can do and they share powers. So checks and balances are these overlapping and shared powers. Those are the checks and balances. So for example, um, whenever Congress passes a law and creates an agency, let's say, the, the um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Congress created that in 1970. There was a bureaucratic agency that was created and then it was administered by whom? Who executed it? The president. The president. Right, absolutely, Tyler, perfect. So um, the president. And so the president is going to then run this and then Congress is gonna say, wait a second, we said to do this and you didn't. So they're gonna hold oversight hearings. And so they're gonna share that power of who's in charge of the bureaucracy. That's an overlapping and shared power. Um, there are still checks and balances if one political party runs all of the things, the house, the Senate, the presidency, the courts even, right? If, if that were the case. So when we talk about that, somebody asked me this question actually via email earlier this week. Um, and I will try to remember exactly what I said. Uh, there were not originally parties, you're right, but um, we have had a pretty good record of there being good checks and balances on the power of the executive and on the power of the, um, and on the power of the Congress. So for example, let's just take um, from 2016 to 2018, Republicans controlled the House, the Senate, um, had all conservative or majority conservatives on the court and had a, a, had a president who was a Republican. Nonetheless, the courts often stu stood in place and said, hey, no, you can't pass that law. So the courts maybe acted as a break on some of those actions. Sometimes uh, Congress and the president disagreed, and so they would have to negotiate to be able to get legislation out there. Government is limited and, and look, partisanship does make it more difficult. There's no question. The more hyper our partisanship is, which it is and has been for the last 20 years, the more difficult it is for this to work if a single party controls it. But it still has worked. 
because um, government's limited by ambition, right? So when we talk about Joe Manchin in West Virginia, he's a Democrat and he's super important right now because he's a moderate Democrat. And so his ambition, Joe Manchin's ambition is gonna act as a check on the Senate as a single Senator, right? Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of that ambition, the division between the, the House and the Senate, the division between Congress and the presidency and the courts, all of those sorts of things are gonna act as divisions and checks. Um, we also have the majority rule. And so when we talk about majority rule, that's populations when it comes to the House of Representatives, to a certain extent, gerrymandering, we'll talk about that later, um, but states have a tremendous amount of power. When we look at the Electoral College later, or when we look at the power of the Senate as compared to the um, uh, House of Representatives, you're going to see that states continue to have power, and plus they have power in their own right. So speaking of checks, it's time to check attendance. I'm glad I put that in there because I was on a roll and I totally would have forgotten. Okay, as a reminder, if you haven't downloaded your Cengage app, it looks like this. Go there and download it, push it. You go to the app store, download it. Once you get there, it's gonna look, actually, it's not gonna look like that. It's gonna look like this. This is your class right here. I'm gonna push 70, which is you guys. Nope, that's not you guys. Sorry about that. I'm gonna push 30, that's you guys. <laughs> there you are, so it looks like this. And then across the top, we're gonna scroll and see attendance is what I'm gonna push and I'm gonna start attendance right now. You're gonna have two minutes. One of the things that you know, if you're still in the process of downloading, two minutes is a long time, number one. Um, but two is that um, if you're in the process of downloading it, you haven't been able to download it, or if you're having problems doing this, or you've already done it, but it's not gonna do it, you have lots of time. You have a minute and 40 seconds left. So go back off of it, reboot it, come back on, and you'll be fine. All right. It looks like 242 of you are members of the class, about which I am very pleased. That means only eight of you have not actually joined um, the class, which um, um, means you still need to do that. But that's a really low amount, and I'm happy about that in the first day of the second week. Um, but yeah, it looks like so far 170 of you have figured out how to do attendance. I'm very proud of you. It's under attendance along the top, attendance. So along the top, it says attendance in your app. Okay, so where attendance is, you still have a minute left. So get on there, click live, then check it. Got it, hit it, perfect. Okay, refresh, yes, absolutely refresh. It's a good way to do it. And if you ask me to fix your attendance, please do it within a very timely manner. Uh, because I'm not going to do it at the end of the class. That means you weren't paying attention. So. so right now, attendance is live. There's still 30 seconds left. If you haven't been able to get in, refresh. And then across the top, it says attendance. Click on the attendance tab. Once you're in Cengage on your phone, okay, on your phone, you have to download the app on your phone. Um, refresh that, Ash, and it should work. Okay. You guys are doing... Pretty good. It looks like 204 of you have shown up here. I'm proud of you. No, nope, I lied. 203. No, 24. 204. There's a little blue link. Click on it and you'll be a circle you have to press. All right, perfect. 205 of you made it to attendance. 37 of you missed. If you tried to get into attendance and you couldn't, say, I'm here right now in the chat and Eric will fix it. I'm here. Well, in, in, the, the chat. in the chat. In the chat. <laughs> in the chat. So you can see your name. Okay. All right. Okay. Are these all people who did not oh. get attendance or are they just? This is if you missed attendance. Okay. It's if you missed attendance, slow down folks. <laughs> if you missed attendance, all right. So the Federalists are gonna support the constitution. They are gonna write 85 articles called the Federalist Papers. Um, and they're written to the people of New York because New York had not yet ratified. It's written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. They are an important statement of political philosophy, and really, most people would claim the only original political philosophy to originate in the United States, okay? 
is significant. I'm not making you read all 85 of them. Sure, I gave you a link to them and you'll read, you know, like 10 of them throughout the class, but only two for today and then one for Wednesday, Federalist One. Um, but the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton's going to write the vast majority of them. The ones written by James Madison are the ones that are the most theory rich, okay? They're the ones who are going to kind of be that politi political philosophy. The Federalists are mainly large landowners, wealthy merchants, professionals. They prefer weaker state governments, a strong national government, indirect elections, which let me explain what that means. Um, the Electoral College is a perfect example of that. In Oklahoma, we vote for a slate of electors that then votes for the president. That's an indirect election. But we directly vote for our senator. We directly vote for our member of the House of Representatives. They favored longer terms. They want a government by the elite. Um, Madison was particularly concerned about the rash nature of the uneducated. And they expected very few violations of civil liberties, of individual liberties by the federal government. They really felt that the state and localities would be much closer. This wouldn't be something that the federal government um, would do. They thought it was very limited and so that it would be okay. The anti-federalists are gonna oppose the constitution. They're gonna question the motives of the framers. They believe the constitution to be an enemy of freedom and we're going to talk about, I know you're not supposed to read those until Wednesday, but we're going to talk about them today anyway. Um, they're going to fear the erosion of fundamental liberties and the weakening of the power of the states. There are going to be small farmers, shopkeepers, laborers, and they're going to prefer a weaker national government, strong state governments, direct elections, where you directly elect your representative, shorter terms, one year, rule by the common man, and strengthened protections for individual liberties. Patrick Henry in his speech gives an argument for no ratification. He's, and his first argument when looking at the constitution is exactly what I played for you at the beginning of the class. It says, we the people. Patrick Henry did not like this. He wanted it to be a compact of states rather than of the people. And there's a reason for this, and we'll talk about that in a second. He says, our country has become a great, mighty, and splendid nation because government is strong and energetic, but not because strong government is strong and energetic, but sir, because liberty is its direct end and foundation. And one great consolidated, consolidated empire of America, your government will not have sufficient energy to keep them together. Such a government is incompatible with the genius of republicanism. And he's referring to small populations being able to make this work. He says, there will be no checks, no real balances in this government. I dread the operation of it on the middling and lower classes of people. It is for them that I fear this adoption. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist One replies, and he said, one of the obstacles to ratification include the interests of men who benefit from the subdivision of this nation into several partial confederacies than from its union under one government. This is a direct jab at Patrick Henry. He says, you know, men like Patrick Henry are big fish in little ponds. And so they don't have anybody to compete against. Ideas to be pushed against. And so they have more power in this way. It says in politics as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution. This idea that using violence, using passion in order to deal with political issues is not going to change anybody. If I come at you with my violent views, that's not gonna change your view, it's going to entrench your view, right? Of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing as demagogues, 
you're special, right? And ending tyrants. Paying attention to the little people, obsequious court, you're the important ones, you're beautiful, commencing as demagogues and ending as tyrants. Whenever it comes to individual rights, the framers really felt that there were no need for explicit protections. Checks and balances plus the states had all had bills of rights and they would protect those things. But there were rights protected in the constitution itself. The writ of habeas corpus, which means that, does anybody know? The writ of habeas corpus means bring body forth. In other words, if you are taken to jail, then you have the right to be seen before a judge and told what you are accused of. The government is prohibited from passing bills of attainder, which says, if you steal my phone, you automatically go to jail for 20 days. There cannot be an automatic penalty for doing something, right? Ex post facto laws, laws that are created after the fact, coffee is made illegal tomorrow, so I'm punished for drinking it today. That can't happen, okay? No religious qualifications can be placed on office holders. That's in the body of the Constitution itself, that you cannot require a particular religion or any qualification of a office holder. Treason is also narrowly defined. Specifically, acting in order to overturn the government or the democratic processes of the United States. Right to trial a jury in criminal cases is guaranteed. So there are some rights that are absolutely protected in the constitution. So we have done, you guys have done an attendance now. Now, right next to attendance says polls. So click on polls, okay? And I'm gonna create a new poll right here. I'm gonna ask you an important question. Oh, just continue on my book suggestion. Everybody should read Alexander Hamilton, the book. Really good book. It's what the play is based off of, but good for your pleasure reading. I'm making this fit what it says on here. And the poll is live. You guys still have a minute and a half. You have lots of time left. So if you're having problems, refresh it, okay? This is not going into your grade. Um, so if you miss it, that's okay. Uh, you can tell us if you want, um, but you don't have to. Uh, mainly this is for, so you guys can participate and think about kind of where you stand on these sort of issues as we go through the lecture. There are constant compromises in the constitution itself. There is the Connecticut Compromise, which means that states have much more representation than do um, individuals. There's a three-fifths compromise, which says that some pe people are not fully people. These both have significant consequences throughout our history, and we continue to deal with them today. But we also had compromises whenever it came time to ratify the document itself. And in particular, Federalists promised that there would be amendments to protect individual liberties if the Constitution was ratified. They said, just, we need a government that works. We need a structure and we can fix this stuff later. Please ratify it. This was a successful plea. And so uh, we see Jefferson and Madison together. They wrote 19 amendments to the Constitution to protect individual liberties. 199 of you, come on, one more, up to 200. Five seconds left, there you go, good job. Um, <clears throat> 10 became the Bill of Rights. They did combine some of them. Some of them were completely just not passed at all by um, Congress and the states. And then one became the 27th Amendment, 
which I think you guys read about during your first chapter. Um, so I'll just tell you that it looks like um, most of you are more likely to be Federalist than Anti-Federalist. Altogether, it comes to 7167. And then it looks like Anti-Federalist and um, more likely to be Anti-Federalist are 34%. That's pretty usual. That's what I usually get out of classes is around 30 to 40% Anti-Federalist, around 60 to 70% Federalist. <clears throat> I want you guys to note that the US Constitution is not necessarily completely straightforward. You know, there's language in there that is meant for us to have some questions about. This flexibility, this vagueness adapts to the times without sacrificing personal freedom. But it also gives the government room to grow. One of the big issues that anti-federalists had with it was the supremacy clause. And we're gonna talk a lot about that next week, but there are 27 amendments. Two of them cancel each other out, so really 25. It's a very short document. It's an ideal type document. So it says, this is what government should do. Here are the powers of government, that's it, okay? This is what government shouldn't do also. It's not a detailed policy document. For example, the Texas Constitution says in the Constitution that it is illegal to um, harness a uh, horse outside of the Capitol building, right? That's, that's in the Constitution. So it's unconstitutional to do that. And, and that's not something that we think about. We don't think about it being unconstitutional to go 27 and a 25, right? That's not in the Constitution. But some states, actually most states, have more policy in their documents. So, my big question for you guys, and you guys can discuss amongst yourself, is how have state laws, shifts in population, and technological changes altered the original intent of the Constitution? One thing I want you to think about is your phone, right? The Fourth Amendment says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, property, papers, and effects. And no warrant shall issue without probable cause and a specific description of the place and thing to be searched or seized. Were they thinking about my cell phone? Does it apply to my cell phone? So what are some other examples that you guys can think about that where that flexibility has mattered? Your computer. Sure. My computer, my online activity. What else? Your car. My car, yeah, right? Those then. And when we talk about the car, um, there was a period of time where, first of all, it's interesting. First of all, they said you have no right to be in the car. And there's Supreme Court cases that say it. And then they start saying, uh, interstate commerce, so we can search your car. And then they said, oh, but we can't really search your car. Or we can partially search your car. We can only search your car under these circumstances. It's evolving, right? Trying to figure out to what extent is this, right? Or my online communication in public and in what part is it private? Is it mine, right? And so we've been trying to figure out that, but we also, in what part is my car private? And in what part is it part of interstate commerce? What else? If you hear a siren, I'm sorry, but um, could it also be kind of how people have dual citizenship now? So I don't, I'm not completely sure, but back at that time, were you like specifically a citizen of the US and France? Could you become a citizen after you were born? Like that kind of thing? Like, citizen, citizenship is weird, actually. Yeah. It's regulated by co Congress and it's specifically in the constitution that Congress is responsible to regulate and it's their power. So for example, the state of Oklahoma has no power over immigration. Mm -hmm. But there are some laws that have been made saying you can have dual citizenship, others that say you can't. Um, I have a friend uh, who was born on a German airbase, 
And when he turned 18, he had a choice. Are you an American? Or are you a German? Hmm. Right? Yeah. And so, but he had to choose at that point huh. once an adult. But I mean, that's specific laws. That's not necessarily um, constitution. That's more policy. I was thinking about it in terms of like, if someone commits a crime. So I, I know a lady and she wouldn't ever commit a crime as far as I know, but she has, <laughs> um, she has citizenship here in America. She has citizenship in Korea. And then she also wants to get citizenship in Hungary. And so it's kind of like, when you have dual citizenship like that, how does the constitution deal with where are your cases tried and who punishes you and all of that kind of thing? These are very complicated international law questions, okay. but I will say you can take my international law class, um, but the 14th amendment deals with it, but also there are things in the Geneva convention that also deal with how we treat aliens in terms of criminal cases. Okay. One more quick question, Cindy? Not Dr. Tapia. Cindy, yes, what, sorry, I was typing and I left it unmuted. I apologize. It's all right. Well, you know what? It's time to go, guys, for today. I will see you on Wednesday. Um, remember that I will be in my Zoom office hour directly after this class. You can get there through the discussions on Canvas. So until then, boomer. Sooner. 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 Sooner.